Yes? Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to uh, the conclusion of the first day of uh, the Through the Roadblocks Realities in Road Motion Conference. Uh, those of you who are brave enough to be, have been with us since this morning, uh, welcome again, and a first welcome to the rest of you. Um, um, the conference is organized by the non-governmental organization NIM and the Department of Multimedia Graphic Arts here at the University, uh, Cyprus University of Technology, and we are glad to have you here. Just to say that um, after the end of the talk and the discussion, uh, we are going to have a brief uh, uh, reception next door, so uh, don't go away. Um, and the introduction to our uh, distinguished uh, speaker for tonight, who is uh, Gayatri Spivak, will be done by Shredko Horvat, uh, who describes himself as a, an activist and philosopher. All right. Okay. Well, that's what they say about him. I know he's a, he's a brilliant young man, you know, he's done it all by the, by the age of 30, you can say I'm jealous, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, and also through his efforts, uh, we, we are very happy to have Professor Spivak with us tonight, so I'll pass it over to him. Yeah, as the chair tonight, I will say just a few words and try to present uh, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak as difficult as it may be. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the, Cyprus, uh, the Cyprus University of Technology for being our host tonight or, and for the following days. And especially, I would like to thank Ellen and Yanis and uh, Neem for uh, making it possible to bring uh, Gayatri Spivak and to invite her to Cyprus, which is, I think, a very important event. Uh, it is of course difficult uh, to present someone like uh, Gayatri uh, Spivak uh, and I would rather start with what Roland Barthes would call biographem, which would mean something personal and so on, but I don't think it's the opportunity now. So I will skip and go to the formal part, uh, which says uh, Gayatri Spivak is a professor at Columbia University. Uh, she is an author uh, of several books, uh, among them uh, the critique of post-colonial reason, other Asia's, that of a discipline, and many others. Uh, probably most of you know about that, uh, but she was also the author of the text uh, Can the Subaltern Speak, uh, which is considered as the founding text of post-colonial studies. Uh, beside that, uh, we could say that without Gayatri Spivak, the reception of Jacques Derrida in the English, uh, English-speaking world wouldn't be the same. Uh, she was the translator of Derrida's of grammatology, and Derrida had uh, a big influence on her work, among others. And last but not least, uh, Gayatri Spivak recently received uh, the Kyoto, uh, Kyoto Prize Award, uh, which is the most uh, prestigious award in uh, Japan for global achievement. And not stealing any room anymore, uh, I will come back later for the Q&A session. And thanks a lot, Gayatri, for being with us. Thank you, Sretchko. Uh, can you hear me? Is this working? Uh, back is okay, right? The real problem with this room is that you can't see the clock, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, well, I'm, of course, delighted to be here. I'm most grateful to Elaine Black and Yanis Kolakidis, right, for inviting me to this important event and to Stretch Horvat for establishing the connection between and um, I, this is a keynote, right? And I'm, I give keynotes uh, often. And um, I give them because I feel that giving a keynote, you can learn something because it is the kind of low note that holds the entire, uh, entire uh, presentation, right? So entire musical construct. And in order for me to think how I could possibly give a keynote in Singapore or in Cyprus or in Kyoto or in uh, Kuwait or etc., this is the way in which, or as it happens next week in Arusha in Tanzania, the, this is the way, this is a way to learn. So don't expect from me, as I'm sure you won't, answers to anything because I'm really here to be instructed and I'm happy that there will be a good long time for really is the mic carrying good long time for Q&A well um, 
I have been many times invited to keynote at various European capitals for some reason, cultural capitals. I don't mean real capitals, but cultural capitals. I seem to be able to move from Cork to Enhoven and see that they are European cultural capitals. I don't know why people invite me for that, but this is the first time that I've been asked to speak at a place that has been given the presidency of the European Union. Although this is undoubtedly an important thing, I would begin by suggesting that since the so-called European Union was the result of a unification proposed and established, I suppose, although very uh, um, uncertainly, on grounds of economic expediency without the sharing of power, the actual play of the management of the European Union, of course, takes place elsewhere. These, um, these actual structures of cultural capitals and presidencies and so on and so forth, these are like many of the abstract structures of things like the World Bank, for example. There has to be this structure. In a sense, I um, myself know very well, I mean, in a kind of common language, one would, use, one would call it tokenism. You know, I'm constantly on committees, small committees, I'm not talking about European Union, uh, small committees like this example of um, how to deal with the fact that in the City University of New York, 87% of the incoming freshman class needs remedial help with English because, of course, huge number of City University of New York, right? Huge number of immigrants, okay? They had made up their minds beforehand that they were going to declare all of the universities, basically all of the colleges, flag staff except for two or three, but they had put me on the committee so that they could say that there is a certain, you know, radical intellectual who is, and I worked my backside off, but that was a very sad thing when I later I realized that whatever I did was not going to count for anything. So to an extent, this structure of sharing power, when the entire union is established on not sharing power, which is why all of this Eurozone difficulty, the, the, in that sense, it's a, for, for those of us who are from the, I mean, we knew this at the time of the so-called constitution. The, uh, that it was actually the constitution was meaningless because of the fact of economic expediency. Constitutions are not based on, on that sort of thing. So therefore, the, uh, the actual play is perhaps elsewhere, Alibi, and even in Ilo Tempore, even at another time. As I move from place to place, giving keynotes because I must raise the money for first class tickets necessary for my spinal disease, to go as often as I can to the six rural schools where I've been giving time and skill for 30 years, one lesson that I learn is that each place is its own center as it thinks globally. I start, therefore, from a first assumption that there is only the local. There is only the local, and the local is global. There, I, I'm not into uh, global and uh, the separation between. It's from the local. I mean, this kind of tacit universalization is older than globalization, because after all, our heads are, do not move. They're not isomorphic with with changes either in technology or in the macrostructures of the economic movement of the world. So that what used to be in the old, day, old days called self-determination of capital does not have the same speed as ideological production. This is just something that one learns. And so therefore, we have to admit that there is only the local, especially those of us who are interested in acknowledging that there are many languages. This is uh, not something that one can just simply avoid in the interest of saying that there can be a global community. This is why I'm most grateful to uh, 
to Stephen Burke for um, an old friend of mine from Columbia days for suggesting that I read Yanis Papadakis's uh, book on uh, the dead zone, right? Because that is a kind of local. Um, uh, local feeling about the East-West divide. You know, uh, most of you, I hope, in the audience know that book. The, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the East-West divide as understood locally. For those of us who are Asians, that one's uh, completely relevant because if uh, I am, after all, from India. I'm, I'm a citizen of India. And when we think about Asia now, it's the Asian century, it's China and India. It's, I mean, India is to the west of China, right? So the, it's Asia rising. I'm just coming from Japan, 10 days there, you know, uh, very competitive nationalisms. For us, that old East-West story, as you say here, in your self-description, this investigation, this is a description of your conference, includes a focus on the voyage of ideas as they cross from east to west and from west to east and how these ideas metamorphose and adjust as they take seed in the cultures they pass through. This particular idea of the, it's Byzantium. You know, it's the Holy Roman Empire and uh, the Byzantine Empire. It's the, the, the East and the West. It's very interesting, very historical. But Asia, as it is moving now, is not thinking of Europe that much. So as I say, I mean, you heard me speak of, of the European Union in a certain way. And some of you looked a little, um, perhaps not altogether satisfied. But on the other hand, if you're really thinking about people moving, this east-west, like Columbus is east-west, remember he was also going passage to India? So this east-west is one um, good historical notion of east-west, which is still very important for us, for you locally, which is why that book to me, uh, Echoes from a Dead Zone, was very, very uh, interesting. And therefore, I want to be a little local with you, okay, before I go on keynoting. And um, so, my earliest childhood as an Indian and a Bengali are scarred by bordering. See, as I was reading the book, I was thinking, gee, here's, here's the story. Partition, it, as you might or might not know, uh, the, we were divided uh, when we, we gained this negotiated independence because uh, Attlee's government wanted to come in in Britain. So uh, in 2000, I saw the border. So one of the, one of the partitions was in my home state. I'm a Bengali, right? So Bengal was divided in two. In 2000, I saw the border as I walked across the no person zone, dead zone, between Bangladesh and India. Because West Bengal, I'm from Calcutta. That's in India, as you know. On an uneven brown painted block of wood was written in yellow paint in Bengali script, Bharat, which is the name of India. Bharat is the Indian name of India. I looked back and there was a sun bleached blue wooden signboard proclaiming Gonu Prajatantri Bangladesh Sharkar, the Socialist Republic of Bangladesh. Okay, and so in, inside there was this uh, place. With the, there was a British railway, but the railway no longer worked. Okay, so it was really quite interesting in its own way. I crossed to the Indian border, and why was it like this? Because this was a route that only subaltern smugglers and so on took. Okay, there are other, uh, the, the plane route is very different, the bus route is very different, the trains. I crossed to the Indian border, border post, and the half-educated border officials demanded a visa into my own country. I carry an Indian passport, but it's because only Bangladeshi underclass crosses that Darshanagede border to board the all third class train to a smaller station in Calcutta. It was a class border. The people sitting in the damn um, uh, Indian border post didn't know that a person who carries a passport that says the Republic of India does not need a visa to cross into India. Imagine this, okay, just as in the Bangladesh outpost, because this is so much a class border. So the dead zone is not the same everywhere. This was so much a class border, and when you're talking about huge countries, the, um, the, it, this was so much a class border that the guys in Bangladesh also asked me, where did you get a visa into Bangladesh? 
because, you know, it was the New York consulate of Bangladesh, right? They didn't know that there was a consulate of Bangladesh in New York. It's an amazing, world's largest democracy I was crossing into. So here was a class. This is a relatively benign example of class borders, although, of course, in my childhood, there's been, I mean, that's one of my strongest childhood memories, the insane killing of between Hindus and Muslims, which uh, happened in 1946, the year I entered school. School was closed. We lived on the border of the Muslim and Hindu sections of Calcutta, and my earliest memories as a child is, you know, uh, voices going up, uh, Hari Wal Hari, which is very uh, Hindu, and then another, Allahu Akbar. And you knew that with both of these, that one was fought with machetes and knives, and you would see d bodies on the, on the street in the morning, which is wh what made me completely an unbeliever. I don't believe in religion, because this is a four-year-old getting this kind of a thing. But as I crossed the border, which had been laid down when I was five, five years old, 1947, uh, I, this was benign. The class apartheid, on the other hand, in education that I witness in my state now for nearly 30 years is not, I hope, replicated in all the states of India. This class apartheid is a displacement of the millennial caste border, which is one of the disgraces of India. All of this is, of course, complicated by the gender borders we share with the rest of humanity. Indeed, the caste border crosses race, class, and gender. We live then with many internal borders in India as elsewhere in the world. Such borders are specific to every civilization, every history. They work in our everyday as they work in the macrologies across the narratives of history. I want to say this because the idea that cultures cross is to me not an interesting idea. Something happens for sure, but this is to assume that there are things called cultures. Culture is an invention of anthropology. The uh, 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 culture alive is its own irreducible counterexample. It always runs away f uh, in, in its way, and the, it, from that point of view, you don't know cultures. You know languages, and you have to know languages in such a way that you enter the lingual memory of the language, the memory that's not just located in, with computers, we understand this better, and then we begin to enter what may be called, since the name is useful, what may be called a culture. So that this idea of cultures crossing across East and West and computing such a crossing of cultures, it belongs more to the world after, and this is an Asian document, after the Nara document of 1994, when the idea of protecting cultural, uh, cultural intangibles was issued from a very aristocratic situation in Japan, Japan which is in itself a settler colony, and then we began to have the entire UNESCO, uh, UNESCO and World Monuments Fund and so on, which began then to declare heritage cities and so on. So ideologically, the idea of cultures crossing and our computing, etc., this belongs with that particular declaration. The idea that there can be a menage of, uh, of, uh, of cultural heritages, UNESCO really runs into this, and that there will be somebody who will be actually inspecting and organizing them. Before that, this kind of assumption was made by the world systems theorists. Their idea that if um, there's economic movement, there is cultural movement, is belied in many different ways. So I just wanted to say this, that even as I sympathize very much with the localized idea of understanding how the other side culturally moves, that the culture now is a, is a colloquial word. We can only understand that not as cultures moving, but as epistemological projects. Epistemological projects, if you use the word epistemology, you are sometimes called um, too liberal, too reformist, 
too individualistic, all of those things. But I would say that those are all excuses. When Gramsci said that Marx's project was epistemological, he knew what he was talking about. It's a hard one. It's a very hard one to accept that it is, in fact, when one talks about the movement of culture, especially if one takes not just race, class, and gender, but something, something approaching caste, into consideration, then one realizes that nothing moves. It is an epistemological project which is undertaken differently by the different levels according to the internal borders of places. So I wanted to begin there because I wanted to, I wanted to share something here when I said everything was local. I wanted to share something in terms of Paparakis moving into the other, uh, other Cyprus. But that is e not recent, because that history, although it is, in fact, historically written down fairly recent, but of course it is not recent. The, and I, standing outside, think also of the insane Osmanli nostalgia of Turkey as such, so that I've written in support of the Ottomans in terms of the imperial envy of the British, and on the other hand, one also must emphasize and analyze that nostalgia which colors, in a sense, we cannot take a position from outside in terms of either this or that. Anyway, my title is No Definitions for Activism, because for me, the definition of activism, since I believe that the project of democracy, I will end with democracy as aporia, which is also one of your one of your phrases, fundamental, since I was uh, looking to find how I could sound a keynote, the, you say that, the, that in Europe, uh, the uh, fundamental aporia of democracy in Europe, and I will suggest in closing, that democracy is a site of aporia. There's nothing special about Europe here. In Europe, the, speci the specialty is not an aporia. It's, an, it's that project of establishing a union with no sharing of power. That's a very different thing. That's a material problem. But apor the democracy is a site of ap aporia as such. But that will come at the end if I'm able to uh, time budget well, OK? So let, let me just say that for me, the definition of activism is the challenge of giving time and skill to supplement the vanguard by trying to produce the intuitions of democracy in the largest sector of the electorate in the world's largest democracy. Let me say that this is not just the world's largest democracy. I always wonder why people leave. Did, I, did he expect me to say something else? You're coming back? Good. He, t he has to take a pee. So uh, it, that is also allowed. The, I should amuse you. Maybe I hope it doesn't take more than 75 seconds, but it's a nice uh, urinary story. See, toward, toward the end of his life, like most men, in fact, like women in their 70s, and I'm 70 now, one needs to go to the bathroom constantly. This is something, I mean, most of you are young. You don't know this, but alas, the body takes its revenge. It's not, uh, growing old is undignified. So at a certain point, the last public thing that Jacques and I did together was in 1970 at a synagogue in the Lower East Side. And uh, he has to go. So I said, go. And the guy who's like uh, organizing it says, OK, we'll call a halt. I said, no, don't call a halt. I'll tell a story. He'll come back. So he went. And I told this story, which is that there was a there was a, a colloquium called the politics of interpretation. This has been published as a book in uh, Chicago in the 70s, and uh, Julia Kristeva and I had already had our fight because I had already uh, criticized uh, about Chinese women in a way that Julia didn't like at all, and we had been very good friends before. I was sad, but what to do? But anyway, the um, she was giving a paper, and I really had to go. I was young, but nonetheless, even the young have to go, right? <laughs> so I was sitting there, and I was thinking, I cannot leave this room while Julia is talking. It'll look very bad. So I'm sitting at, the, at a certain point. I thought, no, there's no way. The, one must obey the body's dictates. And so I rushed. I have heard on m through the years from different continents that I showed my opposition to Julia Kristeva by moving myself at a certain particular point, it, they didn't know about my body's point, at a 
certain particular point in her speech. And I told this story elaborately. See, this is like Boccaccio, frame within a frame. I told this story elaborately while Jack was gone. And then he came back, and all was well, and we resumed. OK. <laughs> so uh, now, my title, as I said, uh, is uh, No Definitions for Activism. Let me say that this activism is not just in those villages. It's also, and slowly, also at Columbia University. Because the feudality without feudalism of the international civil society has to be approached as significantly by a humanities teacher at Columbia as does the subalternity of those villages that I was talking about. OK, so therefore, there, in those two places, I cannot work with definitions. Rather, I have to work abreactively, nachträglich. I consider how definitions are enriched and displaced by that attempted supplementation, worked not only by the ontico-ontological difference, as shown by Heidegger, but also by the epistemico-epistemological difference. If the Heideggerian idea is to show that ontological efforts cannot access the ontic, because it is too immediate, in my understanding, epistemological efforts cannot access the epistemic because it is only codable abreactively. This coding or recoding is necessarily fictive in the strong sense, though with all the requirements of verifiability. So this is why I, ca I say that in the moment of the activism, so-called moment in a kind of expanded sense, you cannot indeed use definitions. Abreactively, the definitions are considered. In a sense, it's somewhat like the ethnographic work of the anthropologists, but as some of you might know, I've talked about fieldwork without coding. I won't go there. Because the vanguard cannot, in fact, the idea of developing class consciousness in the masses by the vanguard is an empty dream. We have to accept this fact if we are serious about removing roadblocks. First, the vanguard does this through consciousness raising, leading to justified self-interest, not to a generalizable will to social justice. Secondly, because the vanguard itself is not educated into the suspension of self-interest, what we generally get in the last resort is capitalist vanguardism, where it's state capitalist or sheer capitalist vanguardism. The international, there may be individual intellectuals who think differently, but remember, we are not individualists. The general idea that the vanguard can, in fact, develop class consciousness in the masses is not a viable idea. It's an idealistic dream. The, the international civil society is, as I have argued, at length and repeatedly driven by an uneven combination of capitalist vanguardism, driven by benevolent feudality without feudalism. And then I will come back to this when I talk more about art. So let me say that this epistemico-epistemological uh, difference is something that we have to, this is, uh, Srechko, this is what I was talking about when we were having our little heated discussion there, that it is something that we cannot really say every self-declared rupture is an unacknowledged repetition because we have to wait abreactively for these kinds of descriptions to come in. And they're fictive very, uh, with veridical claims. They're fictive in the robust sense because if they were not, then history could not be rewritten. At any rate, that is why I say not only alibi elsewhere, but also in illo tempore in another time, the European Union is not playing by the history of Cyprus, although Europe is written by the history of Byzantium. And, and when one looks, in fact, at the history of Byzantium, I've been working on something called subduing Byzantium for the longest possible time. I wish I could have given that, that talk here. It's a, it's a, but then your, uh, your charge is different. You're in the presidency of the European Union. But, uh, uh, the, I gave that talk in Hungary at a certain point, but I, I also spoke about it in the claiming, as I wrote in my abstract, in the claiming of Byzantine art now by 
reclaiming by European modernism. It already had been acclaimed by Clement Greenberg, by Roger Fry, all of those people to the extent that Roger Fry claims the transition from Impressionism to Byzantinism in the Roman art of the empire and describes Cezanne and Paul Gauguin as proto-Byzantines. This, this kind of thing, I was at Yale at a conference which was talking about how indeed Byzant Byzantine art, Christian Byzantine art was a certain kind of modernism, as a kind of precursor of European modernism, so that if indeed we were going to talk about how Europe as a small place is written by that particular history still, so that when you talk about East-West, that's what comes out. We have to also consider that in the metropolis, there is a claim by the huge um, industry of European modernism, which is also, you talked about critique of postcolonial reason, it is also claiming, in a certain sense, the entire global postcolonial. This is a phenomenon in the intellectual world in the metropolis, which then has to be taken into account. What can be meant by the intuitions of democracy? Although I'm moving in terms of what I have learned locally in Birbhum and New York, Birbhum is the place where I have the rural schools, and New York is the place where I do the same work for the children of the superpower who want to help and save the world, and I'm salaried, but they're the same work. Uh, what can I, what can be meant by the intuitions? Be, the, because in two different ways, these people in the villages had been denied access to intellectual labor for thousands of years. The United States is a, is a, is a younger cu culture, but a, a couple of hundred years. But nonetheless, what's happening very fast there is also a denial of intellectual labor. So that the people who are taking, supposedly taking responsibility for the whole world are doing so without any serious intellectual labor at all. So that to an extent, a teacher like me, who teaches actively at both ends of the spectrum, learns her lessons about no definitions within activism from both ends. Although uh, I'm moving in terms of what I have learned locally in Birbhum and New York, the old habit of transnational literacy tells me that these movements travel globally. First, Birbhum. There, among the subaltern children, the polarization between top and bottom comes undone. Children's minds are like wet cement. We are inscribing contradictory habits into them. I'm not yet calling it an aporia, but let's just call it an, as we all know in this room, an aporia is not a contradiction. But nonetheless, so let's say contradictory habits. No competition, yet unconditional pursuit of excellence. Actually, I mean to say class struggle, but let's forget it. No competition, pleasure in schoolwork, yet training to enter the mainstream. Discouraged tendency to leadership, yet encourage questioning authority. Nothing through sermons, everything through classroom moves. Gender balance, gender preference. Easy to say, tremendously difficult to devise as habit formation, not blind obedience, in child subjects and teacher subjects who are equal but not the same, and certainly not the same with me. If you allow, allow me, I would say that these contradictions that Freud so early outlined in the splitting of the ego, the idea that the contradictions are kept at the same time, this is a fantastic idea, and Gregory Bateson in Childhood Schizophrenia have been developed by Bateson, Derrida, and some of us as the thinking of the double bind. And so many of the general European thinkers follow the Kantian line to program the political philosopher within the restrictions laid down by the critical philosopher who acknowledges that there is no access to pure reason, but that practical reason is obliged or programmed to overlook this, declare cause where there can be no cause philosophically stated, and declare freedom where there is no such possibility for the rational human being. Every bit of Kant's political writings repeat this caution, disregarded by those who are unacquainted with the austerity of the critique. I don't know if the person who was um, uh, introducing me in Zagreb last is here in the audience. 
No. So I don't really, but Sergio, you are. So I'm not going to say anything that is not actually what happened, okay? So I'm just going to say that this particular thing, there was a kind of absurd uh, uh, example of this very locally, this business of stating causes, when I was mistaken by the person who was introducing me as only an Indian. See, this is, I'm quoting this uh, in terms of my friend, with, remembering my friend Ajaz Ahmed. You know, when I asked Ajaz to say something about um, uh, problems at home, about genocidal tendencies toward Islam, Ajaz told me, that you ask someone who's only a Muslim. And so I learned uh, to say that it is a mistake to think that I'm only an Indian. And so my, the person who was introducing me with the best faith in the world, you know, I gave one of these disorganized but thought through talks that people who have sympathy with someone who's always running and trying to give keynotes with, in places where she doesn't know um, the history well enough to do so, you see, those people can understand something through their own intellectual charity from what I say. But this person who thought I was only an Indian, after I had given this kind of a strange talk, she says to me, well, why didn't you tell us why? Uh, that in, in India, although there's been socialism for so long, there is still so much corruption. And I said, Jesus wept. I mean, what, <laughs> what? Can, what idea of causality is there? And I will come in here uh, speaking as a representative of my nation state, telling something completely obvious because there was no practice of freedom generated in the population through epistemological exercise, the imaginative training. I've said this, and, and that kind of stuff can only be said in terms of someone who's going to, going to walk into the work. But that's where, you know, that particular question misfired because its answer is what I'm saying now. So to an extent, to go back, I will say that uh, the, when one thinks about freedom, causality, etc., one forgets I'm talking now as a Europeanist. And I know that the European Enlightenment is sick at its home, so-called felicitous home in Europe. This is one of the reasons why I began by talking about the European Union. Nonetheless, it has to be said that the strength of the critical tradition, which in the political writings was not kept up, nonetheless, the strength of the critical tradition is in understanding this particular stuff, that both access to talk of cause and, and access to talk of freedom is in fact defined by a certain kind of intended mistake. It's a very powerful thing within the critique. I, I, I've just been listening in Sweden to a series on global communities simply based on the idea that all human beings can communicate. Of course, this is also an, a very Mm, not very old idea, but an old idea comes in a line. I'm not naming any names because Axel Honneck won't even talk to me. But at any rate, um, I've been listening in Sweden to this series on global communities. And where is this idea very popular? Among the academic intellectuals in Africa. Because, of course, what has to be denied is the incredible wealth of languages. You go across the big universities, Ibarra, Nairobi, um, and so on, Ghana, and you will find that this idea of global communities, because all human beings can communicate neutrally, is very popular. So the, I've been listening in Sweden to a series on global communities simply based on the idea that all human beings can communicate and that if today's ideas of community are too restrictive, one can always make the golden repressed come back by going to pre-capitalist notions of community. I find these ideas alarming and this was just as I was keynoting a thing in Sweden. And you are very fortunate that I'm not going to do what I did in Sweden, and, you know, pre-capitalist ideas. You know, I'm a caste Hindu. Unfortunately, I see the incredible harm done by us, cognitive damage, the, uh, the landless illiterate, my students, right? Much older than British colonialism. It's a very bad thing. So I, but on the other hand, you know, I can, since I'm the felicitous speaker, I can very convincingly, and you won't know that I'm deeply critical of what I'm doing if I do it so nicely, I can actually give you in Sanskrit the pre-Vedic hymns that talk about community. They're, 
the Indo-Europeans coming in. You know, Aryanism is one of the oldest and most awful things in the world. And so, you know, he was talking about the pre-capitalist, pre-capitalist ideas of communities. So, so that he could get his idea of, you know, ethno-cultural agenda, Gayatri Spivak singing a Sanskrit, whatchamacallit, with absolute conviction, you know, I gave the whole thing. It's a fantastic thing, and you can even do the Indo-European cognates, you know, Samana, Samiti, and so on. So, you know, it's the same, right? So, yeah, I could, I'm singing heavy like a Gregorian chant or something. I mean, I'm a Brahmin, man. There's, there's nothing more shameful than, than, than that admission. So, I, and then he said, and then, and then I stopped and I said, you, you think that to celebrate this Aryanism is a way of going into global community because it's pre-capitalist? It's about as pre-capitalist as you can get. So to an extent, this idea of either going back into history or uh, celebrating it because human beings can communicate is not a good idea. The all I need referred to here, not, rather than me singing, is Edward W. Said's powerful idea of the restrictive permission to narrate. Those histories put a roadblock on the so-called enlightened capitalist idea of repaying the global community. The picture changes if one substitutes what cannot be a substitute, unconditional ethics, then you can't talk about culture, you can't talk about East-West. Yet such a substitution, without guarantees, cannot do much directly to create movements or unblock roadblocks. It has to come to terms with the fact that, as I said, the stakes are determined by the local. Therefore, the global is diverse and differentiated. I do not have the skill to plot these diversities in a deeply scholarly way. I've thought them somewhat superficially with the question, if we can all run to the assumptions of democracy, how far have these assumptions been integrated into the general populace of the countries that we collectively name the Arab Spring, practice of freedom, since this was one of uh, the um, items that I wanted to put in in my keynote. The subaltern spoke in Tunisia. A predatory state had produced a general political will. But that is not a lasting political will produced by a predatory state. It's a justified self-interest, as I was saying. A predatory state had produced a general political will that could provide a massive initial response to the burning subaltern body, a type case of subalternity, no access to the state. That's what it was. But the general electorate had had no practice of freedom, and so the result was a welcome regime change, but not the expected change in the polity. Indeed, all of the Arab Spring nation states were about regime changes, but a regime change is not a revolution. To repeat, the fact that 1917 brought in a regime change was incidental to the fact. To repeat, a successful revolution needs the practice of freedom. That is my lesson learned in the bosom of activism. No definitions. Egypt is stuck on the inability for the world to be prepared to consider the question, can Islam have a liberation theology? The, uh, the Obama uh, conversations with Egypt are all, the general tone of it is a tone of surprise that somebody who belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood can be sane. It's, a, it's, it's, it's exceedingly irritating, this particular thing. I have, as I say, I'm not a religious person. But nonetheless, it seems to me that if one celebrates the possibility of liberation theology in the other um, uh, religions of the book, I would rather have liberation minus the theology, but nonetheless, looking at this in this way is uh, important for us. Egypt is also caught between the rock of democracy and the hard place of Islam reactive to Islamophobia, even as the United States attempts to regain a foothold, and it's done something this week, although I don't know if that's going to, I mean, no one knows if that's going to lead to anything. And Libya, where there was a species of civic society, civil society under a tyrant, was packed into the haphazard definition of, quote, revolutions in the area started by regime change in Tunisia in order that the European Union and the United States could begin to fight their wars as Libya's war. If we are thinking of a democratic population nurtured by the practice of freedom, we have, we have no hope there. Syria had begun 
as another candidate to be fitted into that slot called revolution. And of course, again, France has just taken a step that will need this, uh, need a revision here. Now, the less said, the better. And in September 2011, the Occupy Wall Streeters declared themselves inspired by the Arab Spring. The main difference was that regime change there was plotted in terms of elections and run by the hyper-real. Let me quote here what I wrote for them. Has anybody re read that piece in title, the second uh, title called What is to be Done? No, thank God. Okay, so, and you know, it's a very uh, arrogant title, but that's my title. Okay, in the classic concept of the democratic nation state, the state's chief function is the redistribution of revenue for social welfare according to the constitution. After restructuring, the state's role becomes managerial of capitalist globalization. By the way, the anti-statist idea, Althusser, Negri, and so on and so forth, anarchism, etc., I think is, from the point of view of the subaltern, a very impractical idea. I, here too, I'm with Gramsci. It's medicine and poison. The, and, and what you teach is how to use it, and that doesn't last generation to generation. So therefore, I mean, and I'll be very happy to talk about it in the, in the Q&A. Thus the state, I said to the occupiers, becomes accountable to business rather than to people, the predicament of the 99% versus the 1%. It goes without saying that this cannot be redressed simply from within the democratic electoral mechanism of a state, even a state as central to this process as the United States. As I was trying to explain to them, that now I'm speaking to these New Yorkers, even as I was uh, trying to explain to them that it was not uh, that they uh, were not in the same regime change place as all of these other places, and you could not simply account for enthusiasm as a political phenomenon. That's what they were doing with the Arab Spring thing. One has to be a little more, one needs a reality check before claiming any kind of enthusiasm as a general, uh, general motivation. And indeed, if it is a general motivation, it's not going to stand. Anyway, so unfortunately, I said to them, even if the legal system within the state, as well as internationally, the enforceability of the latter not at all as secure as it should be for any redress, even if there were a critical mass with the mindset to curb capitalism, since law is not justice and can be revised, we regularly evidence a situation which is well summarized by the popular t-shirt slogan, if you can't win, change the rules of the game. So to an extent, the idea of cultural movement, the idea of a contained east-west within, within the historical, the idea of understanding the presidency of the European Union unambiguously, that's held within that particular thing, the, the, the worldwide thing of you can't, if you can't win, change the rules of the game. The law can forever be changed in favor of capital rather than people if the entire polity is not educated to desire justice for all. An ill-educated society, I'm speaking to Americans, can be persuaded with the obvious lies of trickle-down economic advantage and jobs created by capitalists rather than if the state has a robust structure of redistribution. Small business is no longer an unquestioned good when venture capital regularly promises global connections. Metaphors can then be negotiated as literal truth, and again, as a literature teacher, that's my basic training, I'll be very happy to discuss, as Stretchko correctly says, I'm influenced by Derrida. How is it then that I'm working in terms of this simple-minded binary opposition, metaphor and literal truth? Metaphors can then be negotiated as literal truth, such as any attempt of the state to serve being misrepresented as a design on the part of the state to control. Therefore, in addition to the legal involvement on the national and international levels, we, said I to them, must continue to emphasize the need persistently to construct a mindset to desire justice for all, from the primary to the post-tertiary level if a just society is to prevail. This is not an impractical or, quote, individualistic lesson. If material gains within political economy are not supplemented by an other directed and just culture that protects the fragility of the public use of reason, there is no hope for the future. And then I went on 
well, I should perhaps go on anyway and not read the other pages. I went on to say that the hyperreal brought me to the question of art. Okay, now this is, what are all these phones? No one shut up their cell phones. That's what we are taught to say right at the beginning of every event. I'm requesting everyone please to shut off their cell phones. But um, anyway, so the hyperreal brings, you know what the hyperreal is, right? I mean, everybody knows. Baudrillard's somewhat unsatisfactory idea of uh, uh, the simulacrum, but it really works. If you, again, if you don't mind making mistakes like I just made with, between metaphor and uh, uh, literal truth. If you don't mind making mistakes and creating these binary oppositions, they're very useful. Logocentrism is not a pathology. It enables. Okay, so therefore, you can, you can use that one. I'll, uh, can, I'll discuss, as I said in q and I'll discuss it more. So, the hyperreal brings one to the question of art. For the hyperreal is the democratic process itself no more than a series of powerful abstractions. That's, what, that's where I was right in the beginning, the presidency of the European Union, the hyperreal. Uh, presented as a humanized simulacrum. It is a, this is, um, it is a species of low-grade occupational conceptual art. What is general, because conceptual art is a real problem, the absolutely pre-critical notion of the artist's intention. I'm told again and again, Ai Weiwei said this, so what? You know, I, I'm, I'm not interested. Let me look at the damn thing. Anyway, so uh, the, it is a species of low-grade occupational conceptual art. What is generalizable in this simulacrum depends on an abstract structure as established and changed over the last 200 plus years. In so far as it is generalizable without becoming general in the fiction of safe elections, it is singular because that's the vulgarization of Spinoza with which Deleuze began to work, and Negri works. It's a very useful one, right? Singularity of art, singularity, singularity, the singular, universalizable, but never universal. That's a very important, in fact, the title of my newest book is, therefore, an aesthetic education in the era of globalizability. That is much more important than globalization. And my editor told me that I wouldn't sell the book if that were the title, so I kept it, anyone wants to sell books. And then at the end, but it's a long book, the last sentence is, if you've come up to here, then know that the real title, and then let the reader work it out. Anyway, so it is singular. When we talk of dissident art, we apply the same or similar norms. Art called dissident by producer or consumer is a site of alternatives being claimed for performance, no longer performative, already existing discursive possibilities inhabited and claimed with new meanings, nudging their way into the investment circuit. The best description of this phenomenon of earlier discursivities pressed into service to describe current realities is of course in the beginning of Marx's 18 Brumaire and so on. I have a long um, thing here about art and philosophy. I'm going to read just a little bit of it and then come to a close because in five minutes I will have spoken 50 minutes and I think that's the way to go. Yeah, 50 minutes and then I want to be instructed. So, let me quote myself. I'm speaking here after receiving <coughs> receiving that prize, the Kyoto Prize. I, uh, I received it in art and philosophy, right? So, and, and the category of art and philosophy, which is, called, um, which is called thought and ethics, I quote myself, I do not believe, and the, I come here from the hyperreal, I do not believe there is a direct line from art and philosophy to social justice. When artists and philosophers, excuse me, <coughs> when artists and philosophers call for social justice, they are acting as responsible citizens of the world, themselves perhaps changed by practicing art and philosophy. Remember that I'm speaking to these enlightened capitalists in Japan, right? Receiving a very large sum of money. So, Therefore, my language is a little bit different from what it is with you. So, uh, themselves perhaps changed by practicing art and philosophy, sometimes using the weight of their prestige as celebrated artists and philosophers in order to make an appeal. The real contribution of artists and philosophers is that they can rearrange desires. 
art and philosophy detached from their producers become instruments for viewer, listener, player, teacher to be changed from mere self-interest or self-description. You notice I use that word teacher, which is last on the list. I'm neither artist nor philosopher, but I am indeed a paid teacher of the humanities. It is our task always to work for the future of humankind, the stream of that, uh, such as it may be. The stream of art within which is included literature and music, today the filmic and the hypertextual, must flow forever. The practice of philosophizing must be and will be passed on from generation to generation so that the human mind is prepared to use the technological setting to work of science for the betterment of the world. Today this is particularly urgent because the digital has all the power and beauty of the wild horse. Without adroit handling, it can be destructive, medicine and poison once again. And I'll be very happy to discuss how I look at this particular idea, which is very much in Gramsci, the idea of a thing as medicine and poison dependent upon use and therefore upon the training of the imagination for epistemological performance rather than cultures moving or structural change assuring that a society will be good or healthy. So. Um, the, I, I'll just quote myself with that and then come to the end of what I want to do in, as the end. The, in, the, at the end, I want to talk about the aporia of democracy as that you talked about, fundamental aporia of democracy in Europe, and I want also to talk just the slightest bit more about singularity. The, uh, let me first uh, talk about aporia. Democracy, as I said, is a site of an aporia. It is not uh, in a fundamental aporia in, uh, in, uh, Europe, in the European Union alone. There is a problem with democracy, but that's a different thing. So the, why do I say that the democracy is the site of an aporia? It's a very old thing I'm saying, that if you look at it from coming from the top, then it looks different from coming from the bottom. The problem there is that there is a, there is a double bind between numbers and excellence. This is in Aristotle already, merit and mathematics, numbers and excellence, and also that there has to be this insoluble struggle between ipsity and alterity, autonomy and others. <coughs> this is because you, I'd hardly had any sleep, right? I'm just come in, so please forgive my voice breaking. Drawing from my own Indian experience, I had earlier found the best model for democracy in Indian classical music. Anybody knows Indian classical music here as a practitioner? Because you have to know it as a practitioner, not as a consumer. And my first degree is in uh, uh, classical, North Indian classical vocal performance at the National Academy of Music, so I kind of knew it. I mean, everything you have to really know doing. Remember, no definitions in activism. So drawing from my own Indian experience, I had earlier found the best model for democracy in Indian classical music. Creative freedom within self-chosen structural rules. Creative freedom within self-chosen structural rules given. Drawing from his European experience, my colleague Jan Elster found the best model of the mindset that will get to democracy in Homer's story of Odysseus, having his sailors wax their own ears and bind him to the mast so that he could hear the siren's magic song and still not give in to the temptation of sailing to their island and wrecking his ship. Both of us were thinking at the top, to create classical music, you must be highly trained. And Odysseus needed the sailors to do his bidding Democracy as self-restraint. This is democracy constraining freedom of speech through constructive autocritique. Democracy from the top. But what about those who have been, by gender and class, forcibly constrained? Develop something like ju democratic judgment, formula for the bottom. The practical development of democratic judgment in the rural child, I go back to my scene of activism, is to distinguish between education and passing exams. Also, I'm constantly interviewed, not about teaching at, at Columbia, but about these rural schools as literacy projects. Literacy and numeracy without good education is useless. 
It even takes away, and not that I'm against literacy, it's a statistic. The Human Development Index asks how many years of schooling, quantity, whereas for our own children, we go around looking what university has the best uh, teaching and so on and so forth, quality control. Mind you, financial aid also comes in, and that's another, uh, another argument, and I'm very deeply involved in what's happening with budget cuts, but let's not go there for them because this is my closing movement. So therefore, this idea that there is a difference, and I, the idea of when I send my child to elementary school, do I say I'm sending my daughter to learn literacy? Why do people think that these schools that where I give time and skill to train teachers are for literacy? This is a ridiculous thing. So to an extent, the, uh, the, the real democratic judgment in the rural child is to distinguish between Education, education and passing exams. And there's a uh, boy, Meghnath Shabur of Bank Tupi Settlement, taught me this in 2006. As I said, the Human Development Index can only ask for quantity, how many years, but this Meghnath, tribal teenager, child of illiterate landless parents, had not wanted to be a statistic for the local landowner as the first tribal child to come first in the state secondary exam. So it would be a nice statistic for the local landowner. Hey, from my high school, first tribal, first class. So we're saying, exactly like Paolo Freire, they're stuffing me. Sister, I want to go to a school where all the, all the students are aboriginals, and I don't have this problem. They're not teaching me. They're training me to come first, said he. And this is an unbelievable bit of statement. So what the landowner did, because democracy in the subaltern is a fearful thing, the landowner, after I had left, evicted this uh, person and closed the schools. 20 years of my labor destroyed because of this one thing. They can be cannon fodder, they can be energized into, as I said, justified self-interest and called by rational choice leftists, Maoists, all kinds of things. But this is a very fearful thing. The schools were gone. So to an extent, the idea of democracy as the site of Apuriya, and again and again I come back to what teaches me this kind of practice where I don't go in with any definitions at all. That teaches me more about the uh, democracy as the site of uh, Apuriya, where our undertaking will be to protect the fragility of reason. Reason is the best grounding error upon which we can, we can put ourselves. Every, every community in the world, not just humanity, not just human, but even pri top primates, produce evidentiary syllogisms. As to with what these evidentiary syllogisms are animated, that is where this whole business of the permission to narrate, the, the impossibility of global communities comes in. I wanted to close on that note. Singularity can remain because I'm going now 55 minutes. The, I wanted to close on that note because it seems to me that we cannot exceptionalize the European Union as a site of a fundamental apuria of democracy. We, we really have to think through because this particular task, if we feel that we have solved a problem, solved the problem, moved that roadblock, that's when the problem begins. In the solution begins the problem. Be and there, your first sentence is a very fine sentence which talks about the dynamics of inclusion and exclusion because it's only by exclu excluding the problematic that you will solve this one. This one cannot be solved. To be equal is not to be the same. So I close there. I did try to talk a little bit about uh, the Arab Spring, and I did try to talk a very little bit about the positionality of cultures and that everything is local, and I'm, I'm ending now on the idea that democracy itself is a site of apuria. It is not something that is special to Europe. And in fact, European exceptionalism is in itself in a place today in the, in the, in the, in the bosom of Asia and also Africa, that, that it's in a place that is not comparable to its own history. Thank you.
Thanks a lot for the lecture. Uh, now we have some time for democracy or direct democracy. I'm sure you have plenty of questions and I'm sure Gayatri will answer them. So we can start with the question right here. Do we have a mic or? Sorry, there are mics at every every two or three chairs. There are mics for everyone. So if you look down, you may find the mic for you. I'll just grab this one. Uh, thanks for the lecture. Yes. Um, I, I would like to uh, take advantage of your suggestion. Go back to some of the things you flagged for the Q and A. One was Negri anti-statism and perhaps also throw in Castoriadis, because I know that at least in Athens has been a return to his work from the 60s, maybe here in Cyprus as well. Yeah. And to add to that, the other thing you flagged, the question of the binary versus, you know, the, you know, the binary, the binary mm -hmm. and, and add to that the question of totality, mm -hmm. perhaps as well. Well, what, what is your position about that, considering how binary oppositions and totality were no-go area not so long ago? Okay, <coughs> I'll start with the binary. Okay, because that's a uh, less problematic thing. The other one requires more knowledge than I have, but I will try. Okay, the binary, you see, what I was trying to say was that <coughs> the binary is what, I mean, this is classic Derrida, really, this is not me, uh, that the binary is what allows us to live and think. Because uh, the, I mean, and, but it's always, under erasure, you see that you're using the binary. And you don't take the binary as, but very much more than a, a need, okay? On the other hand, this is also true, that you cannot really only say that it is a need, I'm just being theoretically correct using the binary, but because in fact, it implicates you. So that all of these, free, and this is something that's not quite classic, Derrida, that all of these so-called freedoms from uh, totalities and binaries, they can only be declared when bound. And to an extent, this binding is our own binding in the binary. And so that's what I was saying. I was calling it a grounding error. Hmm? Because even if you t take the double bind, you cannot, in fact, live in the double bind in order to be able to, although you are living in the double bind. I mean, it's all relating to the structure of the aporia. Um, uh, you cannot live in it. So therefore, in order to live, move on, you have to decide. And when you decide, you transform the double bind into a single bind. Otherwise, you cannot decide. So therefore, the every decision is known to be grounded in <coughs> the most responsible error that one could find. All errors are not the same. Terry Eagleton made that mistake. He thought that everything well, it was just error, wasn't it? But uh, the thing is that this, and that's why I said that reason, that sort of set of evidentiary syllogisms that we can all produce, um, inhabited by different kinds of narratives, the, that reason is uh, the best grounding error. So that's what I was saying. Uh, you know, you can't make a binary opposition between binary and totality and everything else that is not. That part is classic Derrida. But then I gave some stuff there which is more or less moving on from there. So that's what I was saying. It's, it's, uh, it's not uh, very interesting to say, look ma, no binaries because no binaries means binaries and no binaries, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a thing, it's a very old thing. So that's what I was saying. The, um, on the other hand, it is also true that when you see a polarization, it isn't, this is also classic there, is that it is not, that's that old reversal displacement which the shorter Oxford Dictionary has uh, celebrated as the definition of deconstruction. You know, you s if you turn it around, you'll see that it isn't just a binary. It's, it's power, it's ranking. And so you begin to work at displacing, et cetera, undoing, and so on. So again, practically, and um, uh, in the theoretical practice and other uh, ways of describing practice, you have to look at it differently. But it's a wonderful question, and uh, uh, that's how I would for the moment answer it. State. Now, 
I'm, I wasn't really uh, talking very knowledgeably about the state. Well, what I was saying was that I will come at it again from the practical point of view and here I, I can be instructed. I have to, especially I'm going to give the Pulansas lecture in Athens in December, at the end of December. I'm really trying to train myself better. <coughs> but um, what I was looking at let's say, is once more from the practice that I was describing as activism, eh? both with the occupiers and with the subaltern in those rural states. Given the way world governance, and that's what cosmopolitanism is, isn't it? It's not just uh, labor export uh, thrown together and not talking about national origins, which is really an insane way of describing cosmopolitanism, but nonetheless, the, um, given that so-called world governance is so scary and really goes with uh, the, the um, political side of globalization, politics, ideology, the old stuff, the, um, it is the only th instrument that the genuinely subaltern, and subalternization is what's happening, right? The Occupy Wall Street is totally subalternization based. Subalternization is what's happening. And the only instrument that the subaltern can indeed be able to use, because the global is outside of the of the of real subalternity, if you're trying to put them into the circuit of hegemony, knowing that hegemony itself is medicine and poison. It's the state, the abstract structures of the state that the subaltern can be able to use instrumentalizing so that it does not remain only repressive. I mean, I think constitutional uh, utopianism is just that in terms, of, in terms of finance capital. But nonetheless, in terms of, I'm not saying it's a perfect instrument, but I'm saying that to lay it aside when we are our <coughs> ourselves so nation state based when we speak, when we think of the global problems, when every bit of the Eurozone problems are indeed also nation state based, to think that that's only uh, our enemy is to give, throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of reclaiming, to reclaim globalization in the name of good globalization is the old dream of socialism, which failed because that's good globalization, which failed because of an ethics-shaped hole in the middle of it. So therefore, that's why I was saying that all of the doctrines that are, uh, and, and Negri, I think, I find to be um, a, f a student of Althusser there, really, mm -hmm. and more, I mean, reading Pulanzas, it's also very interesting to see Althusser's influence, but there, the contrast between Althusser and Gramsci, as I believe I said here last time too, because that really is a, not here, but I mean when I was with Srechko, it really is a monumental thing, is Bussi Glucksmann's book, Gramsci and the State, because she was then within the, it's written in the 70s, uh, within the Althusserian um, uh, ideas, the, the um, authority of the Althusserian ideas, and certainly this entire uh, entire line that you mentioned, and yet she had the courage to publish that book. I think it's a fantastic locus. That's what I was saying, that it's a, it's a different kind of imperative which is becoming more and more important, and I believe in the case of Negri what has happened is, although I respect him greatly, but I believe, at the, I respect him greatly and I consider him an ally. This is not, uh, this is a, a critique, almost friendly autocritique as it were from within the same struggle. I think one of the problems has been that there has been a certain confidence through digital idealism in the sublation of the American dream into an, a multitudinous empire that is unlike earlier imp imperial formations. That, I think, really is a very scary thing. It needs a reality check. And there, the old instrument of the easily corrupted, corruptible state is still something that one cannot just simply ignore or oppose. So I haven't really given you a learned answer, but I've given you a 
practical answer as far as I can see, you know, my, as far as my nose goes, okay, philosophizing by the nose. But I think by the end of December, I will know a bit more uh, and answer this in a more scholarly way. But thank you for your question. Yeah, so there is a next question by Nicolas. Uh, Professor Spivak, well, thank you, and I suppose thank you is pretty much, uh, 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 doesn't describe the, the term of Haristo in Greek for, uh, uh, for uh, a very illuminative talk. Now, my question concerns your uh, reference to the Enlightenment not being at home in Europe. No, right. I said it was sick. It's sick, in, so at, not at home, feeling uh, in the sense of Europe as being unheimlich for Europe, in, in, for enlightenment in that respect. Oh, that's a nice sentence. I would not have, I did not say it, but I might steal it. <laughs> now, to, uh, uh, now to, uh, what is that to which you refer as enlightenment when you later, when, when you see it as not being at home in Europe, when you later say that uh, you speak or you assert the impossibility of class consciousness when that rests on, I suppose, a certain humanism describing Marx as uh, a belief, say, in the inherent ability of man um, to think of progress collectively. Uh, so what is it that you understand? Of that's, that's a really good question. You know, I mean, of course, everything I said, um, the things that you quoted, very problematic, and I'm very glad that you're asking me the question. Let me try to think through the problems. But the unheimlich stuff, I'm not going to say anything. It's just a very inspired sentence. I wasn't saying that. But yes, you are quite, I, d I didn't say class consciousness is, is impossible. I s what I said was that um, the idea of the vanguard training the masses to class consciousness is not a viable idea. Class consciousness, of course class consciousness is possible. Class consciousness, in fact, is justified self-interest also. So, but that's a, I, I'm not against class consciousness. I'm just, um, I, in terms of um, a, 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 a thinking about a just world, you cannot remain confined to just that because the, what there has to be at the same time is this kind of idea of a will to justice which is not just justified self-interest. Because if that justified self-interest thing wins, and it never does win, as I said, the vanguard has never behaved in that utopian way. But nonetheless, the people still talk, talk and in that way. You know, and don't forget that I'm coming from a communist tradition. I didn't learn my Marxism in the West. I'm, I'm from West Bengal. But on the other hand, and as kind of parliamentary, without a revolution, no totalitarianism, bad behavior with the peasants. Luckily, they lost after 34 years and so on. So it's, not, it's a different story, like I say, not European exceptionalism. But nonetheless, yeah, I would say that the, uh, what I was saying, and you're quite correct in saying this, what then is enlightenment? If it is sick here, where is it well? Okay, and it's a binary opposition idea. Uh, what I, uh, as is my way, I was thinking of the Enlightenment uh, with a capital E as the public use of reason for a just society. And I think this is a, an erroneous uh, kind of thing. But who is afraid of error? You know, the, the what it, it, if you can talk about why you need this, remember, you are not going to be theoretically correct. My real feeling is that the Enlightenment did not happen. Where did it happen? What, who, what class? The, just the Lehrer, as in um, Kant's little, uh, the Gelert, uh, as in Kant's little uh, um, uh, newspaper article? Or the um, uh, Foucault's idea of the modern? I mean, the, what enlightenment? It's, uh, I mean, one needs to read Candide uh, in order to, and I'm a great admirer of Voltaire, I must honestly say it. And, you know, uh, to, to see what he wrote about Westphalia already so early. I mean, remember, that's where Candide came from. It was a <coughs> totally uncivilized place. And the person who actually could give something to us about how to live was an old woman, half whose buttock had been eaten away. 
This is a this is a fantastic text. Let's not go there now. But so to an extent, what I would say about the Enlightenment, if one thinks of it as the the, the result, you see, because we who were subjected to um, uh, colonialism are told that we were given this public use of reason, railways, one currency, hospitals, um, and to an extent this, this carries a degree of truth. At the same time, subalternization, immense violence, um, uh, exploitation without any kind of excuse at all, etc., and the conviction that our cultures are second-class cultures, all of this. But nonetheless, it would be bad faith not to acknowledge that there was also this other stuff, building roads, as the World Bank now builds roads. So to an extent, the idea, that idea of enlightenment, that it was brought uh, in colonization to the rest of the world, uh, the, uh, that's already contravened in perpetual peace by the idea of Co the role of commerce in, in the Enlightenment. So I was saying in a theoretically incorrect way, as is my way, because there is no other way in which to talk about these things, I was saying, and you caught the mistakes, but the, I'm not therefore going to correct them, because where would I go correcting them? Well, what I should do is what you just did, is to show that when one uses this historical description of the dialectics of Enlightenment, about which we all know the wonderful text, although again rather uh, Euro-centralized. Um, so if one looks at it, then one would say that today, most of all, because of the way, for example, in which the socialist structure in Scandinavia is breaking in terms of Somalis and Rwandans and so on and so forth coming in, the Enlightenment betrays its own principles if we take a capital E account of Enlightenment seriously. On the other hand, there must be people who will then say, like you did philosophically, that, you know, what, uh, what kind of humanism do I mean? I don't think one can be without humanism. I think what one has to do, can't, one is bound by humanism. I think what one has to do, and it's again the same thing that I was saying to you, is constantly make an attempt to expand the, uh, the uh, size of the human. I'll give you an example, and then this is a very long answer because you took the responsibility of asking an extremely grave question. I'm on the Council on Values of the World Economic Forum. And this is a wonderful field work for me, okay? One of the, th I mean, you know, I can't m change them. Impossible. Another one of those token appointments. But I talk. And I say, one of the things I say to them when they go on and on about how they're going to influence the young in terms of their relationship to the digital, I keep saying expand the definition of the young and the relationship to the digital will become different. I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm not going to stop saying this. So this is about the only practical thing one can do with the fact that post-humanism is an impossibility. We are bound within humanism and therefore must constantly clean the house of humanism through, I repeat, imaginative, imaginative training for epistemological performance. In other words, how do we construct the human as an object of knowing? See what I mean? So this is the whole, whole thing in terms of the question of enlightenment. And I think your kinds of questions have to be asked constantly so that my kind of vulgarization is not misunderstood. So I'm sure we can still have some questions and the buffet can wait. So are there any other questions maybe in the room? There is one there. I think you have the mic in the... Okay. I just wanted to, oh yeah, okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you once more about the aporia, if I understood right, that sort of you say Europe is basically, you know, a union without sharing its power, and therefore it's an aporia. Is that right? 
I should explain myself. Uh, the um, what I said, I mean, I, I said so many things in such a garbled way that uh, these questions are really focusing on points that had to be uh, made clear. What I said was that the, and this is not, uh, I'm not saying anything new. I mean, there would be no problem with Spain and Greece and all of that if indeed it were uh, a European Union. The, so that, the, what I was saying, and what's his face, Cameron would not be screaming away in Brussels today if it were a European Union. So the, um, what I was saying is, I mean, my friend Etienne Balibar can say this much more knowledgeably, I mean, especially with reference to the Constitution. Uh, th what I was saying was that uh, the European, so-called European Union was based, uh, or is based on economic expediency without sharing power. It's basically a tiny ekphrasis of the uh, false promise of a level playing field in globalization itself. It's like Achilles' shield, right? The, the whole thing is written there in small. So that's what I was saying. I was saying that's not what makes it an aporia. This is the way in which capitalism works. In fact, not just capitalism. The, in our uh, examples of socialism, except for those Scandinavian nations that are breaking down now uh, in their socialism. Uh, so that's not, I didn't say that that was an aporia. What I said was <coughs> that if we want to say, because of this, as well as illegal um, so-called sans-papier, undocumented migration, all of this stuff, we are not talking about gender at all today, but that's fine too. Um, the, if we want to say that that's why democracy is uh, not operating in the European Union, I'm with you. And this, this the European Union shares with many of the uh, most, I would almost say all, of the state formations in our world. That's as it may be. But an apuria is not something that is exceptional to Europe. It is something that actually what makes democracy powerful is indeed the fact that it is something that cannot, you cannot uh, the democracy is a place where you cannot cross over from ipsity to alterity, my autonomy and the rights of the minorities. You cannot cross, out, cross over. It's always negotiable, always negotiable, always circular, always humanized simulacrums. That's why I brought in the question of the usefulness of the inefficient theory of the hyperreal. See that the use. This is why I was saying that the the, the power the power of democracy is that it is irreducibly aporetic. You cannot cross over. This is why the, the things that inhabit democracy are not just contradictions, nor paradoxes. Not nothing like something to which you can propose a solution. It's the, demo, this is what is interesting about democracy, and certainly not in Plato's description of democracy, that it shares something which is intrinsic to being alive, as it were, the uh, living with a contradictory set of instructions. Uh, we are dying as we are living. This, uh, which is to an extent the human being as object at the center of the ethical. So uh, to, I was saying to you that as uh, we grow old, we get to know our bodies better. And you know, I speak as a pre-AIDS 1960s feminist. I know about bodies. But, so, <laughs> but it is really as one grows old that one begins to recognize what I'm talking about. You can't claim it just big, uh, for the misdemeanors of the European Union. That's what I was trying to say. I wasn't saying, therefore, it is aporetic. I was saying, therefore, it is like most capitalist unions. See what I mean? Thank you very much for your question. We have another question up there. Can you turn on the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask a question which is not uh, directly relevant to your main narrative uh, uh, of your talk. 
But uh, it's concerning an aside or an extra narrative comment that you made. And it's uh, concerning the reclaiming of Byzantine art by European modernism. You mentioned that, and I would be interested to hear your main idea about that. Okay, you know, that's a, uh, I must say that I learned that. I didn't know it. I learned that because, I mean, I'm not in art history or anything. Okay, <coughs> they had a conference at Yale where they uh, uh, simply gave as a fact that uh, European mo modernism, uh, in fact, was, uh, was, in a certain sense, they were really saying that Byzantine art had prefigured European modernism, not just predicted, but prefigured European modernism, almost saying that European modernism brought uh, these, uh, the inner principles of uh, basically Christian Byzantine art into their fulfillment, okay? So I would suggest, I mean, and I, I was invited to keynote. And so, I mean, I mean, everybody knew that I didn't know art history. I've never claimed to knowledge. I mean, as I was answering you, for example, I, it, I think that way madness lies to claim to know things that you don't really know. So I did my homework, and I found, you know, and I quoted Clement Greenberg and Roger Fry. They're the two big players. I talked a little bit about Yeats, but if you really want to know about this more, uh, more significantly, then I will be very happy to share with you or anyone here all of the documentation that that Yale conference gave to all of us. It's secondary work. It's not certainly not archival work, but it, on my part. But uh, that's, that's where I was coming from. I'm glad you asked the question, but I really i am not capable of giving, it, giving an, an original answer to that question. But that's where it was. Okay. There is another question. Um, hello. Well, um, it's not a question. It is just like an idea. <laughs> Um, I've been hearing um, you talking about the rearrange of the desire, which I find a very interesting topic. And I was thinking that how can we, ca how can we find a space where desire can be rearranged in an epistemi epistemological con uh, context? <laughs> yes, as a comment, it contains a question. I, look. It's an impossibility, of course, but that's where one begins. So, I mean, that's <coughs> been in all of the, this. I'm not saying everyone should work in this way, but uh, if this kind of work did not happen, not just by one person, but collectivities, uh, nothing would even last, um, I mean, nothing lasts forever, but even last, I mean, to think that the, our great revolutionary experiments lasted 70 years, that's kind of a joke. But on the other hand, this, the, what I was trying to say was this. Um, in the, in the um, teaching situation, the humanities teaching situation, imaginative activism, literature and philosophy, I, I spoke about those two things. I can talk about how the social sciences come in here, but that would be too long an answer, as it is my answers are long. If you got there, what you could not hope to change minds. Changing minds is a uh, totally useless idea. But the, uh, I mean, you assume you can change minds even. But minds do get changed, but that's that epistemico, epistemological divide. But at any rate, so your obligation is to get to know the group that you are connecting to well enough for a rough and ready notion of not individual desire so much, but the word desire understood as reflecting the, the survival techniques of ideology. Here I do find um, Althusser, Stuart Hall, etc., quite interesting in the, in the way. Now, if you, now, of course one knows that this is not the psychoanalytic situation. No. 
And this is certainly not the fantastic lessons taught us by what I consider to be Lacan's best text, which is uh, the subversion of the subject and the dialectics of desire. That is an amazing piece. But that is not a piece that you can use directly, practically. Although Lacan says constantly that the analysts are using it, and he says Hegel should have been taught by analysts and so on, but that's Lacan. But at any rate, the, I mean, but nonetheless, his reading is very good. And no, I'm not talking about those kinds of situations, but a general situation where you st try to understand a collectivity of desires in a rough and ready way in terms of your theory of the survival techniques of ideology. Then, in other words, you have to know the composition, which is why I'm much more a classroom teacher, bad teacher, but nonetheless a classroom teacher, than a one-shot deal things. Because the way I imagine you is probably completely nonsense. I still have to imagine you because of this rearrangement of desires uh, task. That's the task. So therefore, what you try to do, putting yourself within those kinds of desiring frameworks, which you can't do really uh, deliberately, but so what? Everything is impossible if it's serious. So the, putting yourself into that situation, you m try to move it in terms, and believe me, the best, and I'm not going to give a narrative of it because this is just very nice for uh, Europeans, but I'll tell you what it is. The most interesting one is about gender and marriage among the subaltern in my own home state. That's a fantastic place because it's desire as such that's speaking there. So, and no, no narrative here. But nonetheless, that's what I was talking about. You know, it's not, and that is indeed, that rearrangement is connected with imaginative training for epistemological performance, constructing the subject um, differently. That's certainly it, yeah. Okay, be before we end, uh, because uh, Andonis will throw us out to the buffet, I will just pose a last question, if you allow. It will be very short. Uh, so, uh, first you describe the state as a pharmacon, which means medicine and poison at the same time. It can be, at, at one point you even mentioned that uh, subaltern can use the in institutions of the state. Uh, you remember well probably our conversation uh, in New York, it was during the Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. movement uh, when I described you the position of the economist uh, Rick Wolf uh, who said in order to succeed uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, should transform become itself and become a party and uh, take part of elections and so on. And what we have seen now is that actually uh, during these elections and the re-election of Obama the topics and the discourse the Occupy Wall Street invented wasn't on the, on, the, on the agenda, actually. It was Islam, fundamentalism, and so on and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, you were, uh, during this lecture, you were very critical of anti-statist uh, positions. Uh, for example, Negri, I could add uh, Alan Badiou, and so on and so on. So, so my question would be actually, if, on the one hand, we have the experience of Syriza, of uh, Mélenchon and Front de Gauche in France, uh, we could also mention some Latin uh, American mm -hmm. experiences and so on. On the other hand, if we have the experience of Occupy Wall Street, uh, which didn't go a step further, although uh, in the recent months uh, they were active in the question of the debt and so on, uh, what would be your position? Do you understand uh, the statist and anti-statist uh, position as a binary opposition? Or would you uh, agree that it could be also understood as a sort of dialectics? Okay. I could clarify this last position later if you well, want. Well, <coughs> you, you can clarify it now. Okay, uh, in this dialectics in the sense, uh, if we take uh, as an example Porto Alegre and the Brazilian experience of participatory budgeting where you first had a strong movement, direct democracy movement we can say, uh, with uh, different general assemblies of citizens who were themselves uh, trying uh, to propose where the budget will be spent and so on, and then you had a political party who actually uh, put uh, to reality this idea of participatory participatory budgeting. Uh, or again, I don't know if some comrades would agree with Syriza, but again in, in Greece you had the situation of a very strong movement of direct democracy of, of three or four years, 
and then without the part, political party, all of these energies, uh, desires, let's say so, or political uh, uh, ideas wouldn't put through without the political party. So I, I, I don't know if I clarify so what is Why is that dialectical? Dialectical in the sense that the political party needs the movement and then the movement needs the, the, the political party. Oh, so not philosophically dialectical, yeah. but colloquially dialectical. Yeah. Okay. So, um, first of all, pharmacon. You know, it ain't, I'm not talking about pharmacon. The idea of the pharmacon is much more complicated. You know, so, uh, I mean, to use the word pharmacon is almost to point out, hey, after all, you're just doing Derrida's reading of Socrates, etc. No. That's why I d I'm reading Gramsci's notebooks, and they are not at all like... Uh, I know that uh, the pharmacy of Plato pretty well, and I teach it, and it's a much more complicated idea, the pharmacon, the pharmacos, and so on and so forth. I'm not doing that. This is... It's really a very simple idea, and certainly the idea of the pharmacon has the, um, the medicine as well as poison thing in it. But the reason why I don't use that word is because I uh, don't even vulgarize this. Okay, whereas uh, the, there are certain things where, I, as I was saying to my friend, uh, have you le left? Which one? The question about the enlightenment. No, uh, you. He's here. You. As I was saying to you, you know, I, the vulgarization of the Enlightenment has to be, but I don't even vulgarize the idea of the pharmacon. I'm really just talking about, I mean, the way Gramsci uh, talks about the state and so on. Now, I am sorry to say that I do not believe there is such a thing as direct democracy. Because if you go into the texture of what is representing itself as direct democracy, and you really have to go into the absolute micro texture there, because that is the claim, you will see that within it is working a certain kind of vanguardism. And certainly my relationship with Occupy Wall Street is close enough that I can say this, I think, and certainly this was even true in uh, Rousseau's ideas and so on. I don't believe that it is. In f I think that is a, that is a, um, a, 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 a not a viable idea. I think the indirections and uh, structures of responsibility and so on, even micrologically, come into work. So the fact of uh, doing it in a small compass for a little while, citizens saying that this is what we want, etc., that already is inhabited by that apuria that I was talking about. So I can't really uh, talk about uh, direct democracy as anything. And certainly within the entire, I mean, that's, I mean, there I would go back perhaps also, this is not the same, this is not the same um, argument. I mean, that's the first one is a little bit different. It's that self-declared ruptures and so on. And who declares the direction of the democracy and so on, the directness. But that's as it may be. But the second thing, the idea that of subsumption, which is in the... Um, one of the papers that Engels, Engels collected in Capital Volume 3, that is and also the whole Small is Beautiful of the 60s, within which one was very deeply involved. It, that, that idea is also something that has to be thought through, and this is why I was saying everything is local. For me, the word is local. And in terms of the so-called direct democracy, the structures that come into work are historical structures of, or not just historical structures, psychological structures, epistemological structures, and so on, certain kinds of leadership structures. It's, I, I can't talk about these examples because I'm not involved in them. But I can certainly talk about uh, uh, situations where in the anti-Vietnam War movement, for example, complete involvement, or now with the occupiers, I can certainly say that it's not, it, it, it needs a kind of micrological attention which uh, immediately betrays the claim. So that's one thing. What I was trying to say was not that the state is not, um, not um, uh, terrible, but what I was trying to say was that it is the only, the proportionality of the state is something, I'm not saying the subaltern can use the state, the definition of the subaltern 
is the groups that have no access to the structures of the state. But if you are trying to work with subalternity, as some of us have been now for many, many decades, that's because the state is also tied to languages. That is an, 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 a level to which the subaltern can indeed be uh, instrumentalized in some way. That's, 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 um, that's commensurate with uh, the de-subalternization of the subaltern. And, I'm, and I'm, these are big words, but I'm really talking about actual work to, to uh, create infrastructure and follow up and implementation. Whereas on the other side comes the, uh, all of the international civil society intervention founded on the failure of both state and revolution, which then uh, forms this, and that takes for granted the absolute decimation of the state under globalization, and takes that as the model and proof of all of the anti-state arguments. And this then comes in with the old uh, anarchist uh, notions of the decrepitude of the state, and there's a whole rigmarole there. And so what happens then is uh, producing in the subaltern, unconnected with this structure that may be useful, the uh, 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 islands of justified self-interest through this kind of benevolent feudality with our feudalism, naming and shaming the state. This is now, this is a whole circular way of not allowing uh, the subaltern to enter into that very, uh, these are all, uh, as I, I really mean it, these are positive and negative words. I mean, who knows less, uh, who knows better than I uh, the, uh, the, the empty promise of the word citizenship? A person who has lived as a non-citizen for 51 years of her life in a country where she teaches. So I'm not suggesting that the state is good as opposed to uh, the state is bad. I'm neither, I'm not, neither pro-state nor anti-state. I'm saying that as uh, the, as it has been decimated and become a managerial state within this so-called equalization of the system of exchange all over the globe, which was also the premise of socialism, except it was not going to be capitalist, as it has been supposedly decimated, it is reactive in ways that are, that give fuel to those of us who want to throw it away as, the, as anything at all. On the other hand, we cannot, because the, this local behavior is, you know, when we were talking there, you were talking to me in Croatia. So this local behavior that we again and again bring forth, as you don't know the situation in, you know, is that this is India, this is France, this is Croatia. Where does that come from? It comes from not the structure of the state, but some fuzzy thing which is still there. And those of us who deal with the rearrangement of desires, yes, there you are, actually acknowledge, and here, it must be acknowledged, the relative autonomy of these spheres of thinking. That's why I was suggesting that, uh, that, um, uh, that we can't just throw it away in that way. It, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the delicacy of uh, either the Socratic or the Deridian reading of the pharmacon is not something that I'm talking about here. Within that activism also, no definition, because this is my main work after all, this business of uh, making the state, uh, making the state, this is my, uh, I mean it's even more than the work at Columbia because I go three or four times each time more contact hours than a whole semester. So that's a great deal of work. And the work is, in fact, the idea of somehow what state is more corrupt than the, uh, than the Republic of India. It's, it, th therefore, it's not a question of, especially now as it is rising and entering into globalization as a major player. So it's, I'm not pro-state, but I think the anti-state position is unmindful of uh, subalternity. That's all that I was trying to say. Thank you for your question.
Yeah, 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 but, but you cannot stop Gayatri because of a buffet, you know? <laughs> because of what? No, no.